So does everybody have the handout? Yeah. I'm, I'm a bit of a Luddite, you know, bicycles and everything else, and I'm gradually moving over into PowerPoint, but I figure giving a paper handout, you can take something away. Yeah? And you can actually focus on it, make notes and all the rest of it. So it really is my joy, um, all the faculty, all the people organizing this, to be back with you here for this occasion. I've enjoyed being talking with everybody, uh, hearing all the talks, and looking forward to more. So my topic is the human being, God's project, and our response. The glory of God is the living human being. Now, those are words written by Irenaeus of Lyon at the end of the second century, in the last couple of decades, and I think that really they are the most beautiful and profound statement about the human being ever penned. In fact, there's an even, well, there's a better definition um, by, the, by the writer of the epistle to Barnabas, where he says, a human being is earth that suffers, anthroposca ye est in pascusa, but it's a bit more dour. The glory of God is a living human being, much, much nicer. Yeah? He doesn't define the human being in terms of their duty, their capacity, or their responsibility to glorify God, or whatever else it might be, but rather he defines it in reverse. The living human being is the glory of God. The glory of God which descended upon the tabernacle and the temple and filled it, and the glory of God that we behold in the word become flesh, this is now identified with the living human being, the temple of God. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard that statement before, the glory of God is a living human being. It's quoted all the time in all sorts of ways and all sorts of contexts. But that's only half the sentence. The sentence continues, and the life of the human being is to see God. Well, no one can see God and live. And so by a paradoxical turn, of, uh, paradoxical turn, a reversal based upon the overturning of all our categories by the cross, the living human being that Irenaeus is speaking about is none other than the martyr. He makes this really clear later on in his work against the heresies. He quotes the word of Christ. Uh, don't look at the quotations that I tell you, otherwise you'll be distracted, and when I come to it, you won't be, uh, you'll have missed the point. He, he begins by quoting the words of Christ, that the flesh is weak while the spirit is willing, or the spirit is ready. He then argues that the readiness of the spirit is mixed with the weakness of the flesh, and so prevails over the weakness of the flesh. It absorbs the weakness of the flesh by its own strength, the strength of the spirit, and so that person becomes truly spiritual by communion with the spirit. And then he continues, quotation number one on your sheet. He says, in this way, therefore, the martyrs bear witness and despise death, not after the weakness of the flesh, but by the readiness of the spirit. For when the weakness of the spirit is absorbed, it manifests the spirit. So when the weakness of the flesh is absorbed, it manifests the spirit as powerful. And again, when the spirit absorbs the weakness, it inherits the flesh for itself. And from both of these is made a living human being. Living because of the participation of the spirit. Human because of the substance of the flesh. So the Holy Spirit and flesh is a living human being. It is the martyr specifically who's a living human being. Now we can find the same point made in an even more striking fashion at the beginning of the second century, so stepping back 80 years or so. Ignatius of Antioch, he's being taken from Antioch to Rome to be martyred there, and he writes a letter to the Christians in Rome before he gets there, urging them that whatever you do, don't interfere with my coming martyrdom. Don't try and talk me out of it. Don't bribe the judges. Don't do anything about this. And he says, if you are silent about me, I will be a word of God. The play between silence and word. If you're silent about me, I will be a word of God. If you start talking on my behalf, I'll be nothing but a cry. So if you're silent about me so I can go to my martyrdom, I will also be a word of God. Just as Christ is, for Ignatius, the word emerging from the silence of God. 
The silence of God when Christ is on the cross, I think he's referring to. And then he continues, quotation number two on your sheet. He says, birth pangs are upon me. Grant this to me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Grant me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I will be a human being. Anthropos isome. Allow me to be an imitator of the passion of my God. Now, you have to remember that that statement simply flows off his pen as he's traveling by foot under Roman guard from Antioch to Rome. He's not sitting in a study surrounded by books making theological connections. He's reflecting on his impending fate, martyrdom, seeing it in the light of Christ, and in doing that, his words overturn all our assumptions about ourselves. He's not yet born. He's not yet living. He's not yet human. Rather, it's his martyrdom, following the example of the passion of my Christ, his martyrdom will be an occasion for him to be conformed through Christ, uh, to Christ through sharing in his passion and so being finally born into life as a human being. He's not yet born, he's not yet living, he's not yet human. The three most fundamental assumptions we have about ourselves are just completely undermined. Moreover, by sharing in the passion, uh, by by following Christ to his martyrdom and sharing in the passion, Ignatius points out elsewhere that the head cannot be born without the parts of the body. And so Ignatius' birth is absolutely intrinsically connected to the birth of the body of Christ, and so Christ's birth itself. Okay, they're really dramatic statements. So where does it come from? Literally, where does it come from? He's not, as I said, sitting in library making all these connections. It just simply flows off his pen. Now, I think the background for all of this, these really dramatic statements, and you know, I've argued this a number of times, most recently in my book on the Gospel of John, is the relationship between the Gospel of John and Genesis. And it's the relationship between those two works which enable us to see where all of this comes from. So John, the Gospel of John, of course, alerts us to the fact that he is alluding in his Gospel to Genesis. He's also alluding throughout the Gospel to Exodus, but that's another, for another time. From his opening words onwards, he's telling you, think about Genesis. In the beginning, in the beginning. If you want to understand what I'm writing, you've got to think about Genesis. So, what's going on there? How is that so? So let's turn back to the opening chapter in Genesis. It begins with God issuing commandments. Let there be light. Let there be a firmament. Let the earth bring forth living creatures. This divine fiat, let it be, yenithito, is sufficient to bring all of those creatures into existence. Let it be, it was, it was good, the end of the day, next day. But then, having spoken everything into existence by a word alone, having set the stage, as it were, God then does something different. He doesn't say, let it be, he changes from using, and I'm going to be referring to Septuagint, because after all, the writers I'm reflecting on, they're also using Septuagint. Okay? So he changes from using an imperative to using a subjunctive. Not let there be, but let us make. It's a project. It's the only thing that God specifically deliberates about. Let us make a human being in our image after our likeness. It's the only thing he specifically deliberates, but everything else is let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. And it's the only thing which is really said to be his divine purpose and his resolve. So scripture opens with God setting the scenery upon the stage and then announcing his project. And I would argue that this is what's completed in the Gospel of John. When Christ is on the cross, And his last word is, teteliste. 
Not simply as we might think if we just put John and the synoptics together, it's come to an end. You know, my work is done. But to tell us it's brought to completion. It's perfected. Yeah? And what it is that's perfected is indicated by Pilate just a few verses earlier, unwittingly by Pilate, but John's making those plays throughout the gospel. Behold the human being. Eke homo, idu or anthropos. So, Scripture opens with God setting a scene and then describes his project. His project is to make a human being and it's not complete until Christ is on the cross, behold the human being. So the particular project of God to, create a, to make a human being in his image and likeness is not simply accomplished by a divine fiat, by an imperative then and there. It depends, rather, upon the fiat of Christ. Not my will, but thine. And it depends, it depends also, subsequently, on the fiat of figures like Ignatius, who in Christ give their own, let it be. So John's playing with Genesis in all of this. And it's not just Genesis 1, but also Genesis 2. It's very clear that John's playing with Genesis 2, for instance, in John chapter 9, where you've got the, the man who's born blind and is healed in the most peculiar way. Christ supplies what is lacking in his original formation in the womb. The eyes, it's not that he became blind, he was born blind. The emphasis is on that. Christ supplies what is lacking in a really peculiar way by spitting upon the earth to make mud and smearing it in the place where the eyes should have been, thereby recapitulating the original formation of human beings. And moreover, as Jesus asserts, that this is not a matter of sin that the man was born blind, but so that the works of God might be made manifest, Irenaeus in concludes, quotation number three, the works of God is fashioning the human being. Opera otem de plasmatio est hominis. This is what God does. He makes human beings. That's his project. And then carrying on with John 9, it's completed. The, pro the project is completed upon the Sabbath, the finishing of the humanity of the man born blind who can now see the light, finished on the Sabbath, but not simply the Sabbath of the Pharisees in which no human work is to be carried out, but the Sabbath of God himself whose work is fashioning the human being in the statue of Christ, is completed in the passion when Christ is crucified on the sixth day of the day of, sixth hour of the day of preparation towards the evening so that he rests in the tomb on the Sabbath, which is the great Sabbath, as John points out. So all of these connections are being played. One further connection was already noted by Tertullian. Look at quotation number four. He says... As Adam was a figure of Christ, Adam's sleep sketched out the death of Christ. So Adam being a figure of Christ, that's Romans 5. Yeah? Adam's a type of the one to come, he's a figure of the one to come. So also his sleep is also foreshadowing the death of Christ, who was to sleep a mortal slumber, so that from the wound inflicted on his side might be figured the true mother of the living, the church. Okay, so Tertullian's making that connection. Something's going on in the way that John's describing the passion of Christ and what's going on in Genesis 2. And the parallel is played out, in fact, by John across the whole of the Gospel. And then between the Gospel and the Apocalypse, and come back to that in a minute. The figure of the woman appears, or is addressed by Christ three times across the Gospel. So at the beginning, the middle, and the end. So quotation number five, the first line there, John 2, 4. She's first addressed at Cana, when Jesus' hour is not yet. Woman, what have you to do with me? My hour is not come, just as woman. Yeah? When the hour comes, John also addresses the woman from the cross. Uh, so the next part there, John 19, 25 to 26. 
I've given the RSV translation not because it's the best, but because I want to make some corrections. Okay, so it, it goes, standing by the cross of Christ were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to the mother, woman, behold your son. So there's in fact, there's this mistranslation in the RSV. When it's given from the perspective of the evangelist, in verse 25, it is his mother. So standing by the cross is his mother. Yeah? When, um, when given from the perspective of Jesus, Jesus doesn't see his mother, it's Jesus sees the mother. Yeah, it's gone from his mother, as John would see it, to the mother addressed by Jesus. And when he addresses her, he again dresses her as woman. Woman, and now he speaks of sonship. Woman, behold your son. Now between the beginning and the end, at Cana and at the cross, we also have Christ talking about the woman in chapter, in chapter 16. So the last part of quotation block number five. Here it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. He's, he's consoling his disciples as his departure approaches. You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When the woman, so there she is, when the woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the tribulation for joy that a human being is born into the world. The hours he mistranslates it and put it simply as a child. It's, no, it's a human being is now finally born into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your sorrow from you. So the passage here contains a transition. Lost in most translations, a transition from the birth of a child to the birth of a human being. And now look at it again. The description of the woman is really odd. She's in travail, and she's described as having sorrow. Well, that's not the word you'd expect to use for a woman in travail. Pain, anguish, suffering, something like that, but not sorrow. So the question then, as Judith Liu puts it, is, is this a birthing or a dying? This is Judith Liu. We meet birth here, only when we encounter death. Indeed, the birth, which is not narrated in this gospel, becomes through 1621 a death, sorrow. Or is a death a birth, she asks. Or perhaps, just as we saw with Ignatius, it's a birth into life um, through death. The birth into life as a human being, the birth of the human being into the world, which comes about through death. Woman, behold your son. So then if you put the parallels together between the crucifixion narrative with the blood and wine coming out and the rib being taken out from, from Adam, the sleeping Adam, the woman built from the rib, taken from the side of the sleeping Adam, is called Eve, or in a Septuagint, she's called Zoe, life, because, as Genesis puts it, she's a mother of the living. Well, in fact, all her children die. But she's paralleled by the blood and the water coming from the side of the dead Christ, who, as, Ignatius, as Tertullian put it, is the true mother of the living, the church, but whose children enter into life by dying with Christ. So the parallel is the reverse parallel that's going on there. Dying with Christ through baptism, taking up the cross, death and resurrection, being born into life. So the imagery of the woman, the virgin mother, is pervasive in early Christianity, the virgin mother of the church. Irenaeus, as well as talking all that he says about martyrdom, describes the church as being the virgin mother who rejoices when she receives as living children those who go to their martyrdom. She's the one who, um, he says, she's the mother who, because of the love that she cherishes towards God, sends forth throughout all times a multitude of martyrs to the Father. Or as he puts it in another passage, 
the virgin is a pure womb that was opened purely by the pure one, Christ, in which we are now reborn as human beings unto God. So you've got this parallel then between Genesis 2, the rib from the side, Christ, the woman coming from the side, behold your son born into life. A further background for this idea is found in the transition which Paul already makes mention of in Galatians 4. Um, the transition from Isaiah 53 to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 53, the hymn of the suffering servant, culminates with the proclamation that the barren one will now give birth to many children. After that long hymn about the suffering servant who takes upon himself all of our sin, all of our iniquity, who, who is a lamb before the slaughter and so on, culminates with, Rejoice, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in travail, for the children of the desolate one are more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. So the barren one, as Paul puts it in Galatians 4, is our mother, the heavenly Jerusalem, who gives now birth to living children of God, those who are now baptized into the death of Christ, dying with him. You can find that throughout early Christianity. Then the parallel continues with, in the Gospel of John and Genesis further. In Genesis, when Eve is finally brought to Adam in Genesis 2, so far in Genesis 2, he's only been um, described as being the one placed in the garden to work it. When Mary, the new Eve, sees the risen Christ, the new Adam, she thinks he's a gardener. Yeah, so you've got the, 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 the woman all the way through as a mother until the cross, and then the mother appears in the form of the spouse, thinking of the new Adam as being the gardener. And these two are co both called Mary. And both of them symbolize the church. So Ephraim of Syria, he says this. I forgot to put this on your sheet. He says, the virgin mother is a symbol of the church when she receives the first announcement of the gospel. And it's in the name of the church that Mary sees a risen Jesus. Blessed be God who filled Mary and the church with joy. We call the church by the name of Mary, for she deserves a double name. Okay? So it's in the name of the church. The church is one who receives the gospel, the barren woman, firstborn of all creation, the barren woman who receives the gospel now gives birth to living children. Um, and this is what's symbolized in the gospel, in the Annunciation narrative, and in the resurrection account in the Gospel of John. Now that then opens up, and I'm going to come back to my topic, okay, but this is, this is too much fun. Uh, this opens up a new perspective, a different perspective on the relationship between the Gospel and the book of Revelation. And if you haven't read it, Peter Lighthart's new commentary on the book of Revelation is simply brilliant, I think. He's forcefully argued that the Gospel and Revelation form a two-part royal romance. The gospel opens with an announcement of a wedding, but the hour is not yet. And the gospel culminates with the bridegroom being unveiled upon the cross. The hour has come. Revelation opens with the vision of the exalted Christ, the living one, the slain lamb enthroned. It's written by the same John, in the same place, the foot of the cross is standing before the heavenly altar, but telling it in two different registers. And then the book of Revelation culminates with the marriage feast. So it's like a two-part royal romance, pivoting upon the cross. Yeah? And so if the gospel describes the preparation of the bridegroom, then the apocalypse describes the preparation of the bride, and specifically the human church. So Peter Lighthout puts it this way. He says, the incarnation produces the first fully human being, Jesus. Revelation unveils the formation of a fully human church as it describes the cruciformation of witnesses. To be a witness is to be a witness to death, a witness in death. 
So the wedding intimated at the beginning of the gospel is consummated at the end of Revelation, both pivoting upon the cross. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if your heads are spinning at this point and you're thinking, where on earth are you getting all of this from? And you're just simply making it all up. <coughs> well, <coughs> there are indications that these kind of connections were being made in circles around the evangelist John, and that's indicated that by various early writers who are giving testimony to this. So Athanas uh, Anastasius of Sinai, he reports that the elders who knew John and whose tradition was Papias recorded, they read, Gen they read Genesis as talking about Christ and the church. Straightforwardly. That's how they are reading Genesis. And that's what we're seeing in the, book of, in the Gospel of John and Revelation. A reflection of Genesis seeing it as Christ and the church. Um, it's also recorded that they correlated the seven days of creation with the work of Christ. So Anastasius is a little bit later, but within the second and early third century, we've got Irenaeus and we've got Victorinus of Pitau independently recording the tradition, which both independently go back to Papias and the elders who knew John in Asia, about the seven ages of Christ's life. Irenaeus affirms that the elders taught that Christ had even reached old age. You're not yet 50? Well, you don't say that to somebody who's only 30. You figure it out. Okay. More interestingly, quotation number six on your sheet. This is, shows, this is where we really want to come to. Victorinus, again, referring to tradition that goes back to the end of the first century, says, Christ consummates his humanity in the number seven. Birth, infancy, boy, boyhood, youth, young manhood, maturity, death, seven, okay? The seven ages of life. I'm going to come back to that later. So finally, my last point with regard to the Gospel of John, then I'm going to move on, is that it's important to note in the Gospel of John, Christ's path to the cross, from which he says it is finished, is completely a movement of love. There really is no atonement theology in John. Yes, at the beginning it says Christ, the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But as it's actually described through the rest of the Gospel of John, it is totally a movement of love. A love to the end. And this movement of love is one that's inscribed in the very relationship between Father and Son. Christ says, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And then this love is traced back to God himself. This is the way God loves the world, by giving his only begotten son. Not for its condemnation, but so that the world might be saved through him. This is love that God himself is. And moreover, it is a love that is expected of each and every one of us. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down one's life for one's friend. Okay, now we can take our reflection one step further. The definition of Chalcedon, you all know that, I hope, affirms that the one Lord Jesus Christ is perfect or complete in his divinity and humanity. Teleon in his divinity, teleos in his humanity. Together, in one hypostasis, one concrete being, one prosopon, one face. Now, this is often taken as simply implying that Christ is everything that it is to be God and everything that it is to be human together. I think that's completely wrong. To take it that way would mean starting with an understanding of God and the human being apart from the revelation of God in Christ. You'd be starting with a non-Christian God and a non-Christian human being and then squashing them together into one, saying that Christ is both of these. Rather, I would suggest, we should take Chalcedon as affirming that Christ defines for us what it is to be God and what it is to be human in one. 
There's only one hypostasis, one prosopon, one image of the invisible God. There's only one place to look, one image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15, talking about the one on the cross. In whom, Colossians says, the fullness of divinity dwells bodily. There's no other place to look for that which is divine, apart from its fullness dwelling in Christ himself. Now, if that's the case, then we can, in fact, go one step further. If Christ shows us what it is to be God, that, that, that is, that Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way in which he dies as a human being. Not simply by dying, we all die. But the way in which he dies, laying down his life as a totally free act of love, showing the whole of his life and ministry and service to be self-offering love. Now, if Christ shows us what it is to be God in that way, well, in that case, he's also showing us what it is to be human. I say you are gods, says the psalm, the words quoted by Christ. He doesn't quote the second half of the psalm verse, but clearly means it to be implied. I say you are gods, but you will die like human beings. So if then to be human is to live by taking up the cross in a life of voluntary and loving self-offering in a Christ-like manner, if that is what it is to be human, then that gives us further insight into why in Genesis 1, God switches from an imperative to a subjunctive. To put it bluntly, God could not have said, let there be a human being. Because if, that were to be, if, that, if you were to try that, it wouldn't be an act of voluntary self-offering love. He can make those who grow into that and give their let it be, but you can't make one who's already living by voluntary self-offering love. It wouldn't be voluntary, it wouldn't be self-offering, it wouldn't actually be an act of love. So God makes those who are called to become human. We're not yet human. That's what Ignatius shows us. So God does create those, male and female, who can learn and grow into such virtue, into the perfect manhood, the measure, the fullness of the statue of Christ. And so again, we are the ones who've got to say, let it be, to the only work which is said to be God's own work. And so perhaps now we can see further depth into why Ignatius says he's yet to be born. And also what differentiates Christ's birth from our own birth. It's not simply that Christ was born of a virgin, but rather that he willed to become human for us and for our salvation. Mary's virginity is not a statement about her own purity. Her virginity is a testament to the fact that Christ and the Spirit are the active ones. It's not a statement about Mary, it's about Christ who willed to become human. We, on the other hand, have come into existence, I really hesitate to say born, because to be born is to come into life, We've come into existence with no choice of our own. There's a novel by Dostoevsky called The, the Possessed or the Demons, where one of the characters protests, no one asks me if I, want to be, if I want to be born. We think we're free, but we've got no choice about it. We've been thrown into existence. And we've been thrown into an existence in which whatever we do, we die. We are as good as dead from the beginning. No doubt about it. We are passive victims of mortality. Necessity and mortality characterize our existence from the beginning. No choice about it. Whatever I do, I'm going to die. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. But the life-giving death of Christ turns that inside out and opens up a path for men and women to voluntarily take up the cross, to say, let it be, 
to voluntarily take up the cross in loving self-offering for others and thereby change the very ground of their existence from necessity and mortality, which is how we've come into existence, changing the very ground of that existence by turning that death inside out into love and freedom. So to become human, as Christ has shown that to be, in whom there is neither male nor female, is indeed to be gods, sons of the Most High, dying as human beings. So again, the only work of creation in Genesis said to be God's own project, said with a subjunctive rather than an imperative, let it be, not, not let it be, but let us make, requires us to say, let it be. So later theology would talk about that perhaps as deification or theosis, or differentiate between image and likeness, the former being some kind of capacity, and then get into a debate about whether it's lost or not lost, or whatever else it might be through the fall, and so on. This earliest level that I've been uncovering through Irenaeus and Ignatius, going back to the Gospel of John, simply see the great mystery in terms of becoming human. It is to become human, as Christ has shown that to be. It's towards that that we are to grow and to strive, putting behind us all childish things and attaining to maturity. So let's take that further. According to Adam, okay, sorry, according to Paul, Christ is a uh, sorry, Adam is a type of the one to come. Tip us to Melondos, Romans 5.14. That is, Adam is a preliminary model. Adam's a sketch, a beginning. Adam's not the final reality. And so the way Irenaeus would read that is that Adam and Eve are children. They're infants. They've just come into existence. They're inexperienced. Um, whereas Christ is the one who shows us what the human being is. So there's a movement then from Adam to Christ, from type to reality, from infancy to maturity. Drawing further upon Paul, this time from Corinthians 15, Irenaeus describes our beginning and our end in terms of the first Adam and the last Adam, where Paul specifically says the first Adam is from the earth, animated by a breath of life, the last Adam's from heaven, with the life-giving spirit. So, quotation number seven. This is almost all one sentence. I love Irenaeus. Almost all one sentence, which is why I put some things in bold and some things underlined, just so you can see how it's coordinated. So, Irenaeus says, just as at the beginning of our formation in Adam, the breath of life from God having been united to the handiwork, animated the human being. I've chosen the word, it's a Latin word, animavit. I've chosen the word animate in England. It's got the resonance of anima ensouled. Yeah, it's got a life power in it, but it's an anima. Animated the human being, showed him to be a rational being. So also, at the end, the word of the Father and the Spirit of God, having become united with the ancient substance of the formation of Adam, at the end, uh, the Word and the Spirit rendered the human being living, not animated, but living, and perfect, bearing the perfect Father, in order that, just as in the animated we all die, so also in the spiritual we may all be vivified. For never at any time did Adam escape the hands of God, to whom the Father speaking said, let us make the human being in our image after our likeness, and for this reason, at the end, not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the good pleasure of the Father, his hands perfected a living human being in order that Adam might become in the image and likeness of God. It's, it's totally eschatological, not protological. It's towards the end, looking at the end, not the beginning. So the first Adam, he's saying is an, an, following Paul, Corinthians 15, the first Adam is animated by a breath. Take the clay, breath of life, and so on. Well, the, the main characteristic of a breath is that it expires. <gasps> That's what a breath does. If we try to hold on to our breath, if we try to preserve it, 
it will nevertheless expire, despite our best efforts. We might prolong it for a day or two. Paul begins his discussion in Corinthians 15 with exactly this point. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And of course, that's a point made by Christ himself, quotation number eight. I've chosen that version because it's, it's fascinating. He says, Whoever seeks to gain, Christ says, whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it. If you try and gain your life, you're going to lose it. But whoever loses his life will preserve it. Okay? So, that language about preserve, that, that, that's such a bad translation. Yeah? It's, if you try and preserve your life, you're going to lose it. If you try and hold on to your breath, you're going to expire. Yeah? But his point is, if you lose it and extend for my sake, for the kingdom, for the gospel, and all the other kind of things, the word used there, zoogonisi, is not to preserve. It comes from the Greek word zoe, life, and goneo, meaning to beget. You give birth to life. The background for that word is um, really, I think it's um, first, uh, first Kings 2.6, where, uh, where it says, the Lord kills and makes alive. It's always that way around. It's not God gives life and takes it away. God kills and makes alive. Yeah, I kill and turn alive. It's the same word being used there. Kyrios thanati, kezogoni. Okay. So if we lose our life for the gospel, for the neighbor, for the kingdom, and so on, that is, if we use our breath, which will expire anyway, whether we like it or not, if we use that breath to take up the cross and live not for ourselves, but for others in an act of self-offering love, to live as Christ shows us it's to be human, then the life that we begin to live that way cannot be touched by death because we've entered into it through death. It's not simply that we've preserved our breath, but we've entered into a different mode of life, zoe, rather than breath. Um, we've entered a different mode of life which cannot be touched by death because we've entered into it through death. This is the life that Christ promises to bring. If he says, I come, I've come that you might have life, it means you don't have it. What we think of as life is not. You're going to die. We're as good as dead from the beginning. So, we have yet to be born into life to become a human being. That's exactly what we saw with Ignatius. I'm not yet born, not yet living, not yet human. Allow me to take up the cross, follow Christ, and I'll be born into life as a living human being. So the project of God to make the human being in his image and likeness is completed at the end. It's not protology. It's not primordial history. It's eschatology. And this requires our taking up the cross, following Christ, death and resurrection, and ultimately, as Paul says in Corinthians 15, transformation. We will all be changed. Instead of being males and females and identifying ourselves in all the ways we do, we will be changed to become human as Christ is human transforming our lowly body to be like his glorious body. So what it is to be human, then, is not a protological starting point with some kind of static or fixed content. And moreover, the growth from Adam to Christ, spanning the whole of the economy from beginning to end, is a process of fashioning in which, as Irenaeus said in the passage we are looking at, Adam never escapes the hands of God. We're continuously clay in his hands, being molded, so at the end we can be in the image and likeness of, Christ, of God as Christ himself. So to become human is to grow. From, to become human is to grow from our initial state as we've come into this world, into the fullness of the statue of Christ. And this growth takes time. Irenaeus expounds this dimension of time in Against the Heresies 4, 37 to 39. He starts off with his opponents, the Gnostics, and they ask him the question, well, if this is what God wanted us to be, 
Well, why didn't he just make us that way? Unable to deviate in any way and just be like robots. Irenaeus' response is that only those who are free and able to grow in time are able to become something other than what they were initially. And this requires growth by learning and by experience. It's by experience of both good and evil that we learn to shun the evil and hold on ever more firmly to the good. He uses the analogy of a mother with a child and argues, yes, God could have given us meat from the beginning, but it wouldn't have benefited us anything. We need milk to begin with, and then as we grow, we're gradually able to have meat. Milk is needed first, then meat. Now, in all of this, you have to remember that there are all sorts of different definitions for the word perfect and human that are at play. Okay? So, um, a newborn infant may well be perfect, but would still be unable to walk. You know, you don't have any, we had that had the, in the talk just before lunch. No, it takes time for the newborn infant to learn to walk. And learning to walk inc includes falling down, getting bruised, and getting up again. Learning to become strong like that. So if you define a human being as a two-legged animal that can walk, well, newborn babies aren't human. If you define a human being as a rational animal, well, most toddlers are not rational animals. Not many I've met anyway. Okay? Now, if you define a human being as voluntarily laying down your life in an act of love for your neighbor and finally dying with Christ so that the strength of God can be made manifest in weakness, that requires further time. It requires growth in virtue. Most fundamentally, for Irenaeus, um, without freedom and the possibility for growth, we would never have been able to become something more than what we were at first. Now, he carries on. I've got a long quotation we're going to look at in just one second, and we'll finish soon after. Um, by definition, the created cannot be uncreated. By definition, it's created, not uncreated. But that is not a restriction upon the omnipotence of God. For his omnipotence is demonstrated in the way in which the created is brought to share in time in the uncreated life of God. This is a change in the mode of existence. Not a change of nature, but a change in the mode of existence which requires preparation and training, and the whole economy has been tending towards this. So let's go through quotation number nine. A long quotation, but I, could, I didn't know how to abbreviate it. It's not quite one sentence, but it could well have been. He says, With God, power, wisdom, and goodness are demonstrated simultaneously. Power and goodness in that he willingly created and made things previously not existing. Wisdom in having made those things that have come into being rhythmical, harmonious, and elaborate. He's such a musical theologian. We are, we are made rhythmical, harmonious, elaborated, which through the superabundance of his goodness, receiving growth and continuing for a long period of time, obtain the glory of the uncreated. We come to share in the very glory of God himself. The glory of God, after all, is the living human being. The very glory of the uncreated, of the God who ungrudgingly bestows good. By virtue of being created, they're not uncreated. Granted, but by virtue of continuing in being through a long course of ages, they shall, free, they shall receive the power of the uncreated, of the God who freely bestows upon them eternal existence. And so, in all things, God has a preeminence, alone and created, and the first of all and supplier of existence of all, while all others remain under God's subjection. Subjection to God affects incorruptibility, continuance in incorruptibility, the glory of the uncreated. By this order and such rhythms and such a movement, the created and fashioned human becomes in the image and likeness of the uncreated God. Again, it's at the end, not at the beginning. The Father planning everything well and commanding. The Son executing and performing. The Spirit nourishing and increasing. 
the human being making progress day by day and ascending towards perfection that is approaching the uncreated one, for the uncreated is perfect and this is God. For it was necessary for the human being to be created, and having cre been created to increase, and having increased to become an adult, and having become an adult to multiply, and having multiplied to become strong, and having been strengthened to be glorified, and having been glorified to see his master. For God is he who is yet to be seen. The vision of God produces incorruptibility. Incorruptibility renders one close to God. So what is most striking about this passage, describing the whole arc of the economy, the growth from Adam to Christ, is that it's patterned upon the life of each human being. The seven stages of life, a pattern of reflection that goes all the way back to Hippocrates and beyond, and what we just saw a few minutes ago with Victorinus, Christ perfects his humanity in seven. Okay? So the pattern of the whole arc of the economy from Adam to Christ is recapitulated in our own life, or our own life recapitulates the whole. So we can see the lifespan of each human being as recapitulating the whole arc of the economy from the infant Adam to the mature perfect Christ. And perhaps it also recapitulates the history of the human race. So Mary Lacron Foster puts it this way. She says, both biological evolution and the stages in the child's cognitive development follow much the same progression of evolutionary stages that are suggested in the archaeological record. The same pattern that we see across the span of a human life, we can see across the, the archaeological record of human existence. So the course and pattern of the stages of human evolution are recapitulated in the life of the human being. We come into being. We learn to walk by falling down. We acquire reason. We grow in our inner resources and outward expression. We become adult. And then as we grow towards our old age, we retreat back into ourselves as we approach death. Okay, and then finally, and I do mean finally this time, to conclude our exposition of Irenaeus, there's one further passage I want to look at. I'm going to end with that, where Irenaeus is again developing a point made by Ignatius, but takes it further, much further. So Ignatius, I've talked about how he writes to the Christians in Rome saying, don't, don't interfere. Yeah, I will, I'll be born into life as a human being. He also says, um, let me be the bread for the beasts through which I may be, may be able to attain to God. I am God's wheat, and through the beast's teeth I shall be found to be the pure bread of Christ. So through his martyrdom, he also becomes a Eucharistic offering. Yeah, just like Christ becomes a bread which descends from heaven by ascending the cross, so also Ignatius becomes the, the very pure bread of Christ. Irenaeus quotes him and then develops it further. This is the last quotation we've got, the quotation number 10. And again, it's, it's one sentence. All of that is one sentence. Um, so just as, so also, in order that. So just as the wood of the vine planted in the earth bore fruit in its own time, and the grain of wheat falling into the earth and being decomposed was raised up manifold by the Spirit of God who sustains all. Then, by wisdom, they come to the use of human beings, and receiving the word of God, they become Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Christ. So the whole, the whole natural cycle, grain and grape fall into the ground, they decompose, they're raised, um, and then he says, by wisdom, they come to the use of human beings, because we do something to it. We don't just bring grain and grape to the altar. We turn it into bread and wine. Yeah? Uh, Byzantine writer Nicholas Cabasilas points out that human beings are the only animals that cook. Yeah? So if you want a really good definition of the human being, not just the glory of God as if that's not enough, but you can say the human being is a cooking animal. Okay? So we do something to it. We bring it to the altar. It receives the word of God, becomes the body and blood of Christ. So you've got that whole cycle. So also, our bodies, nourished by it, yeah, so it does something to us, like we do something to it, it does something to us. Our bodies, nourished by it, having been placed in the earth and decomposing in it, 
shall rise in their own time when the word of God bestows on them resurrection to the glory of God the Father who secures immortality for the mortal, bountifully bestows incorruptibility on the corruptible because the power of God is made perfect in weakness. So our own death and resurrection is like God's own Eucharist. Yeah, it really is. It's our entry into that Paschal mystery, and become, we, become, we become the very Eucharistic gift in that. Now, if that two parallel circles are not enough, they're put in parallel with a consequence. In order that, in order that, we may never become puffed up, as if we had life from ourselves. No, we do not have life from ourselves, and we need the experience of death to convince us of that. Because until we die, we think we do. Okay, so strength made perfect in weakness. In order that we may never become puffed up as if we had life from ourselves, nor exalted against God, entertaining ungrateful thoughts, but learning by experience that it's from his excellence and not from our own nature that we have eternal continuance, that we should neither undervalue the glory of God nor be ignorant of our own nature, but we should know what God can do and what benefits a human, and we should never mistake the true understanding of things as they are, that is, of God and the human being. It's beautiful. So all of that's done so that we may maintain the truth about this. We come back to the point I made earlier. The truth about God and the truth about the human being are intimately tied together for the simple reason that both are revealed together in the crucified and risen Christ, as proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with Scripture, who shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, and so also shows us what it is to be human, not simply by dying, but the way in which he dies, voluntarily as an act of love, and so on. So I would suggest, final sentence, if we have such a hard time today trying to define what it is to be human, ending up with so many different conflicting claims and ideologies, it is perhaps because we set our sights too low. I say you are gods, but you'll die like humans. Okay. So Father Bear and I have been friends, Father John and I have been friends for... Um, a long, long time. In fact, so long that we used to have the same hairdo and um, <laughs> no beard. So it's been uh, been a long time, but uh, it's it's great. Thank you for your your presentation. And there are a lot of good questions that I know um, folks would love to have uh, have answered, and, and um, so will some will need to be followed up on later. But so let's start with Philippians two. So Philippians two. Um, this one who uh, becomes in the form of a servant, in, in becoming in the form of a servant, is in the likeness of anthropos um, and becomes anthropos. So same word in, in both of those phrases there in, um, in seven. So you want to maybe, maybe address what does this mean, coming in the likeness of he, uh, uh, the man, uh, Anthropos, and... Yeah. To me, that actually sounds like... Um, the question of Anthropos uh, and becoming Anthropos, part of the background also is the language of Son of Man. Yeah? And the language of Son of Man, although after centuries of dogmatic theological reflection, we tend to think Son of God, Son of Man, Christ is divinity, Christ is humanity. Actually, scripturally speaking, Son of Man is a higher title than Son of God. Yeah? There, there, there are many sons of God out there. You know, The sons of God in, in Genesis are doing all sorts of things. Um, son of Man is a higher title and it's with the title Son of Man that you've got that expression uh, as the Son of Man in Daniel and other places like that. So if I were to hear Anthropos and as, or the likeness of, or as Anthropos, I probably think that the same idea is going on behind both, that it is Son of Man, Anthropos, a new revelation, um, and that the as is picking up the Danielic expression. Something like that, maybe. Well, and ties it with dying on the cross oh, sure. in the next verse. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. That's, 
and then as the one dying on the cross, having the name above all names exalted and so on, so that every knee bows, which is an expression of omnipotence. Yeah? So the expression of omnipotence is, in fact, the weakness of the cross. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Something like that. Yeah, sure. So uh, a number of very uh, good questions here. One, you mentioned um, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yeah. Um, in, in what way, if there is any way, does being... Uh, does does the doctrine of the Trinity historically the doctrine of the, of the Trinity um, give any reflection on what it means to be in the image of God? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Despite all of that theological reflection of the twentieth century, which keeps on doing that, yeah, to be a to be a human, to be in the image is to be a person, relationship like the Trinity is in relation and so on. Uh, that's not scriptural. That's not patristic, it's nowhere like that. Um, and in fact, if you do that, in a real sense, you put Christ out of the picture. Yeah, you know, you've got the Trinity in heaven, one of whom is Christ, and it's there being a person relationship that we're imaging here on earth. Whereas the New Testament is just simply emphatic. Christ alone is the image of the invisible God. Here's where you look if you want to see what God looks like. But he's showing you what God looks like in human form. So he's also showing you what it is to be human. Yeah. Yeah. Would you show us the Father? Yeah. And it's have yes. you been? Have I not been with you so long? Precisely. Um, but in order to be able to look at Him and see the Father, we need the Spirit in us. Only with the Spirit in us can we say Jesus is Lord. Uh, only with the Spirit in us are we in Christ to be able to call upon His Father as our Father and say Abba. I mean, it's just basic, yeah. which seems to be forgotten by all of that 20th century theology, but. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, that's great. So, me, so, so actually, yeah, I just, yeah. just want to add yes. to that. Uh, it may well be you can make a case for that, for, for the personal relationship, but then you've got to do it on other grounds and don't just uh, assume that. Yeah. So a lot of um, the ethical implications of a, an understanding of image in which it's either corporate or individual that people are the image or have the image. And, and as, as we talked about already this week, that many of the ethical implications that come from that, that understanding yeah. of, of um, being human or what it means to be human, what would be the ethical implications uh, would you find of this um, understanding of what it means to be human? that it requires active striving on our part to follow Christ, to take up the cross, and in so doing, grow into his stature. Um, but that ultimately, you know, for those who've never heard of that, those who've rejected that, because they've present, been presented with a really false image of what that means, or all the other kind of permutations, those who've never had the intellectual capacities to be able to hear it and all the rest of it, uh, maybe there are so many different permutations that one can think about with regard to that. Um, we are still, nevertheless, all of us brought to the same point. You know, death is the great leveler. Rich and poor, king and slave will lie side by side and become the same clay. Yeah? So we actually find our identity in that when we no longer work, now God can work in that. But, you know, that doesn't resolve, that doesn't relieve us. The fact that we've all got the same end of that doesn't relieve us from uh, the responsibility of doing everything we can now to grow into that image that Christ has shown in service of others, alleviate suffering, wherever it might be, and all the kind of things one can do. Yeah. But it also means that it doesn't make it, it's not a burden upon us um, to, you know, whether we've made it or not, because ultimately we do all come to the same end. So the, the dying then is um, not merely the, the final dying yeah. that we do, it's the taking up our cross and yeah. so, die daily? Or? So my brother's a monk of Mount Athos in one of in St. Paul's Monastery, and in one of their refectory, I think they've got a, inscribed in stone above the, the entry, if you die before you die, when you die, you won't die. <laughs> Which is a really, really good thing. If you die before you die, when you die, you won't die. Really, really neat. Because if you just think about it, the move from how we've come into existence in Adam to being in Christ is a movement of voluntarily accepting our death. 
Just, just so straightforwardly, voluntarily accepting our death, dying with Christ in baptism, taking up the cross daily, not living for myself, living for another. Okay, just straightforwardly. But it's really interesting that Paul in Romans changes the tense. If you have died with Christ in baptism, sacramentally, once for all, however you want to, however you want to understand that, if you have died with Christ in baptism, past tense, you will rise, future tense. So why the change from the, from the, the past to the future? Well, simply because we haven't died yet. <laughs> you know, literally, we haven't died yet. And so Paul continues by saying, so live as if you're dead. Yeah? Just live as if you're dead. Take up the cross, die to yourself, don't put yourself forward. And a hundred and one different ways in which you can spell it out. Okay? Which then, I mean, the whole of Christian spirituality is a, is a development or flowering of the different ways in which that could be done. And if we forget that it's a matter of life and death at the root of it, then it just becomes a moralistic system. Yeah, no, it's life and death that's being, being at the root of it. But one f- further thing says, if you have died with Christ in baptism, past tense, you will rise because you're not dead yet. That means we're in a kind of a gray zone. And I don't know how to ex- express that gray zone apart from using the language of, I'm caught in the first person singular. Yeah? So at the end of the day, I can only say, hopefully, didn't I die well to myself today? And then you realize a paradox. I am dying to myself. Well, it's me who's doing it, which means I'm not dead. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm caught in, the, in that first person paradox of that. Um, but as I learn to take up the cross and die to myself, but it's still me who's doing it, I'm learning ever more to be able to say to God, into thy hands I commend my spirit, so that when I do finally die, I'll be able to say, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yeah? Um, and then when I finally die, as we just said earlier, you know, we're both placed in the same ground, rich and poor, king and slave, it's totally level, and then we finally become clay. You know, we, 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 we so easy talk about God taking clay at the beginning and making a human being. Well, I've never been clay, and I don't think anybody here looking around, I don't think anybody here has ever been clay, but I can absolutely guarantee you we're all going to become clay. Clay's our end, not our beginning, but it's our end in which we finally stop working and now God can work, so he can take the clay and make a living human being. Yeah? And so what we're learning through the course of this life is to become malleable clay, in his hands. To have seen, to thy hands I commend my spirit, rather than saying, it's not fair, it's not fair, give me more time. Yeah? But either way, you're still going to die. Such a comfort. I know no one agrees with me. <laughs> it's such a comfort to know that we're going to die. That we might have life. That we might have life, yeah? And that we can already start doing that and enter into that now and all the rest of it. Because it really means God does have us in the palm of his hand. So John 3, mm-hmm. being born again, yep. um, kind of talk about is this, is this merely, and it, maybe it goes in hand-to-hand with what you're saying here, is this a, a future at our death and when we were born no. this time from above? Uh, is this yeah, but, but Born again, born from above, it's the same kind of right. thing. But it's right. now being born voluntarily. Mm-hmm. So rather than being thrown into existence with no choice in how else am I going to come into being apart from being thrown into existence, and whatever comes into being passes away. It's just basic. Yeah? Whatever comes into being passes away. We can now use that mortality as a mode of birth to enter into life, and way I spoke about it. Um, going back to Paul's statement, you know, if you have died with Christ in baptism, you will also change from past to future. I would say that what it really indicates is that birth again is actually concretely our actual death, which we are anticipating at this point. We're anticipating our entry into that, and we're already enacting it, depending on different traditions, sacramentally, charismatically, but but you're enacting it now. And to the extent that you're enacting it now, you're already tasting the life which can't be touched by death because you've entered into it through death. But you're not there yet. You're simply not there yet because you're still living by breathing rather than living by the life-giving spirit. Yes. Very good. So two two quick questions. One, um, uh, Jesus speaks to the, when he's speaking to the Samaritan woman, calls her woman as well. Is that that related in any way? It could be. It could be. Um, 
and he's talking with her about marriage. So, so Peter Lightheart would say, you know, he's meeting all these women across the way, and he's talking all, with all of them about marriage. Each of them could have been a bride, but none of them turned out to be. Yeah? But the woman, now is not my time, uh, in, in John 2, uh, when the hour is, which is his passion, he says, woman, behold your son. Yeah? Um, and there's so much more one can do with that. We'll come back to that. And, and then the question of, of birth, the woman he's talking about in travail in birth in John 16, speaking about her travail, giving birth to a human being. Well, here's a human being. The birth is happening and so on. Yeah. 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 So the, uh, most of the writers that you've uh, referenced uh, here are early. I know yeah. you've just completed or are completing this uh, yeah. work on Gregory Nissen. Um, is there anything that you've seen, that you've learned, that has been progress in Gregory? Kind of what, what are you so, finding there? So Gregory, uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing what he does. How long do we have? Uh, I'm, I'm, I better keep an eye on the time because it really is mind-blowing. Um, he actually patterns his work on the Timaeus in terms of three different parts of works. So in the Timaeus, Timaeus starts off by giving an account of creation according to uh, the, the, the forms, the ideas. Then Timaeus turns and says, well, actually, I've only given half the account so far. I've also got to give an account of the straying cause. And at the end of his speech, Timaeus says, well, I've got to put these two together and bring them under a single head. And he then talks about a whole... Um, medical description of the human being, okay? Gregory has got a similar threefold structure to his work. The first 15 chapters, he gives this absolutely wonderful description of the human being. The pinnacle of creation, the, the very fact that we're standing upright so that our eyes can look to heaven rather than down to the earth. The very fact that you talked about this earlier, the very fact that we've got fingers, yeah, means that we can cut up our food so that our mouth can be adapted for speaking words rather than gnawing meat. I mean, all of that kind of a beautiful description of the human being. Um, and then in chapter 16, he says, well, look around you. Where do you see that? And what you see when you look around you is miserable, suffering people who are killing each other and falling sick and dying. I mean, where do you see what we've just said? So he then goes on to a whole account about how, you know, God is working with us. We're work in progress. Yeah? And that requires a cooperation of our will as we learn to say, let it be. And then he brings it together in the final section um, and, and does it in terms of the individual human life. But I want to part of that is I want to repeat what I said yesterday evening. He reads Genesis 1 as being the evolution of the soul culminating in the human being. So he says Moses is an anthropogeny, describing an anthropogeny. So, in the ancient world, plants have got souls. We've come to think of soul in a very particular way. But for the ancient world, um, soul is just a, is a power of life. Yeah? So if you look at a rock and a plant, well, a plant's, they're both matter, but the, the plant has got the power of growth and nutrition. It's got a vegetative soul. Okay? So after you get heaven and earth, you then get, you, you get, then get plants, and then you get animals. So animals are like plants, but they've got a further power in that they have a sense perception, yeah, interaction, whatever it might be. And then you get the human being. So the human being is a final stage of all of that, and we have power of growth and nutrition. We've got the power of sense perception. We've got the power of rationality as well, and we've got freedom. So it's the evolution of the soul. And he actually says, uh, nature, he makes nature the active cause. Nature makes an ascent, as it were, by st in the steps of life from the lower form to the higher. Okay? Then he does that with regard to uh, the individual human life. We start off with a seed deposited in the womb, yeah? just like plants in the earth. A seed deposited in the womb, and we grow, body and soul grow together, so that the, in the womb we grow by, grow by the power of, sense, uh, of, of uh, growth and nutrition. Yeah? So we, our bodies take in fluid or whatever else it might be, we grow, we grow. Uh, the power of soul manifest in us at that level is simply a vegetative soul, growth and nutrition. When we're ready, we come out into the world of sense perception, and now we start learning about sense perception, and we grow in and through all of that. But we're not yet rational, and to be rational means to learn, um, to differentiate and discern through sense perception. 
we, you know, our mind only knows things because it, information comes to us through the senses, but everybody knows the senses can't be trusted. Yeah, you know, it might not be as it, as it seems. It might not be right what you're hearing and all the rest of it. So our mind grows through sense perception, but also learns to differentiate itself from sense perception. Yeah? And then it culminates with us putting off the old man and putting on the new. So we're in this world as a womb in which we're continuing to grow to our final birth through death and resurrection to the final transformation that Paul talks about in Corinthians 15, like a chrysalis to a butterfly. Yeah? So it's just phenomenal what he does. Uh, and I can get on to everything he does about male and female, which I hinted at in my talk but didn't do anything with. Um, but that's, that's another story. Well, thank you very much okay. for uh, this. Can we, you join me in, well, in, in saying thank you to Dr. Bear? Yeah, thank you.